Good evening, everyone. If you can hear my voice loud and clear, can you type V for victory? Good to see every single one of you here. Okay, guys, are you able to hear me loud and clear? If yes, type V in the chat. And tonight, we are going to go through some very important market updates before I go on my <laughs> one-month holiday. So I just want to make sure I uh, keep you guys informed, keep you guys updated. Then you know exactly what to do next as well uh, for the next one month after I come back, okay, before I come back. All right. So now let me just make sure I uh, disable the waiting room so that all of you guys can come in as well. Good to see every single one of you. I can see that, yes, okay, Johnson can hear me loud and clear. Fantastic, fantastic. How about, okay, now I'm going to share screen. Okay, and now I'm recording as well. Fantastic. Now I'm going to share screen. And tonight, I'm also having a very special guest join me. Later on, I will introduce who he is, right? Because he is really, really expert in the economy sectors of, of everything that the data we're going to analyze today. So that's why, okay, later on, I will invite him in. But before that, all right, let me just officially start this market update. All right, how many of you are excited for the market update? If you are, can you type M in the chat, okay? M stands for market update. Thank you so much, Aligado. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Jasmine. All right, good to see every single one of you. Now, are you guys able to see my slides clearly? If yes, can you type S in the chat? Just want to make sure that we are good to go. And I should also actually log in from my uh, phone as well so that I can see all of your responses. And if you have any questions in between, all right, feel free to just put it in the chat all right, so that uh, I can answer your questions. And later on, I will definitely also invite the expert to go through this uh, Q&A session together with all of you guys as well. All right, so guys can see my uh, screen, right? Okay, fantastic. Now let's get started. Now, firstly, with this current market condition right now, the past six months, the US market right has gone up 15%. So guys, what do you think right now? Do you think the market is uh, high or do you think it's low right now? What do you think? Can you put it in the chat? H or L? High or low? I think it's really obvious, right? It's high, right? And and in fact, it's all time high. <laughs> okay, all time high. Huh? So now in this all time high situation, obviously we want to see that where, well, the market can be all time high, but if the valuation can be supported by whatever economy factors and all this, then it's good, right? So that's why we are going to analyze some of the uh, uh, indicators, some of the statistics, as well as some of the valuation metrics together so that we can all um, understand and at the end, they come to the conclusion by yourself as well. Uh, what do you intend to do in this all-time high market situation, all right? So <laughs> every time it's going up and you get a little bit worried, okay? Jasmine, don't worry about it, okay? Later on, I will also share with you exactly what I'm doing so that, uh, yeah, you can use it as a reference. Now, the first thing we want to look at is actually the Buffett indicator, right? How many of you have heard of this before? If you have heard of this, can you type BI in the chat? Now, if you are very new to this, what exactly is a buffer indicator, right? It's using the total US stock market value, right? Divide by the GDP of the US. Now, obviously, if the GDP is very high, and at the same time, if the stock market it's low, then you will have a very small value of the Buffett indicator, right? On the other hand, if the market valuation, that means the market keep on going up, going up, going up, but at the same time, the GDP stays pretty much stagnant or maybe just going up a little bit, then the, the Buffett indicator will become very big. So how does that uh, relate to what we are going to understand tonight, which is the market valuation. So what we want to see is whether is the current market valuation being substantiated by the GDP of the US. So as you can see, the analyzed GDP, okay, as of April 2024, was $28 trillion. And at the same time, our market has already reached a $53 trillion. So what does that mean is, it's almost, right, almost two times of the GDP. Uh, to be exact, it's 188%. So is this considered high or low? We need to look at the historical benchmark, all right? 
how has the market been uh, performing based on the GDP in the past? So as you can see, this is the line, the blue line that you can see here. This is a buffer indicator line, right? So if it reaches the historical trend line, which is a gray area, right? That means it's pretty average. So if it stays hover around 50%, which is the gray line, right? And then historically, it also slightly uh, ages forward, like it just upward over time. So as long as they hover around gray, it's considered very fair. That means the market is not too high, it's not too low, right? Uh, and obviously, if it drops below the gray line, then fantastic. That means you are having a very undervalued market. On the other hand, if it rises above the gray line, which is happening right now, right? As you can see, plus one standard deviation is the orange line, plus two standard deviation is the red line. And right now, we are actually approaching the red line and it dropped a little bit. And right now, we just hover around here. So guys, can you tell me based on this, right? Is it overvalue or is it undervalue? What do you guys think? Over means expensive. Under means very cheap, right? The market is giving you a lot of opportunities. Yes, exactly. Right now, it's actually overvalue. In fact, almost reaching to the peak, the peak of plus two standard deviation. And previously, if you see that the, uh, once it reaches plus two, what happened was here, right? If you still remember, we had our bear market not too long ago, right? About a year plus, right? And at that time, before the crash, it was above plus two standard deviation. And then after the crash came, right? And right now, what happened was right now, we are just re-inching upwards again, close to plus two. So uh, it shows that it's quite overvalued at this period of time. Now, the second thing that we can also use as a, as a reference, right? We don't want to just use that one indicator. We want to look at different things. And that's why later on, I'm also inviting Ethan. He's the economy expert to also analyze the data for you so that you have all these data points in your hand, right? So now, Let's take a look at the P-E ratio, the Sheila P-E ratio of the market. And P-E, P stands for the price, right? The price divided by the earnings of the market. So if the price is very, very high, but at the same time, if the earnings, that means the market, the companies made up of the market are not earning a lot, then obviously you will have a very high P-E ratio. That means if you are investing right now, you are paying a lot more for the earnings of the company. So how much is the P ratio right now? And as you can see, we are approaching close to 35.37 times. And historically, when it reaches around 40 area, can you see? This is the 40, right? When it crosses above 40, the market drop, right? And then or when it reaches near the 40, in fact, previously, it actually started to drop as well. So right now, we are also pretty much at the dangerous zone, right? How many of you can see that you are you feel a little bit of danger right now? If you felt so, can you type D in the chat, okay? D stands for danger, right? Someone is asking about, oh, what is the situation before last presidential election? Okay, that's a very good question, huh? So goodness, is it bad time to start investing right now in dollar cost averaging? Now, so let's take a look. So this is what happened. As some of you can anticipate from the data right now, it's kind of at the high valuation range, right? So because of that, recently, uh, Fed also announces certain things that kind of also trigger certain emotions into the market. And right now, actually, the market is, is at the fearful area. So what does that mean is when the market is fearful, what do you think likely will happen? What do you think? What do you think likely will happen if the market is fearful? What do you think? Is it likely to go up? Is it likely to go down? Well, just like what Vindra said, right? It's likely to be very volatile. So uh, is it likely to absolutely 100% go down? We cannot say for sure, but we can be quite certain that since the market is fearful, if any disturbance or any maybe negative announcement whatsoever might just trigger certain um unnecessary activities or sell off in the market. It's more possible right now, right? So that's why, right? 
in order for us to fully comprehend the picture, whether is the market indeed overvalued? What is the economic statistics? Is it substantiating what is happening right now, right? So that's why we want to really overlook at the economy uh, statistics, economic statistics, and uh, how many of you understand the importance of looking at all these statistics? If you understand, can you type E in the chat, okay? E stands for the economic statistics. And for myself, all right, I really felt that the best person that to share with you all this is not me, right? Because I really, some, some sometimes uh, I don't keep up with all these stats, right? However, I know that it's actually crucial as an investor to at least keep yourself, right, a breath of whatever is happening in the economy. And that's why right now I want to invite, right, Ethan to come up. And Ethan, I've known him for years and he, right, he has been consistently being able to predict the interest rate trend. <laughs> Later on, uh, I think he will he will also share to share with you a little bit more like how come he's able to be consistently being able to predict the interest rate trend. And most importantly, because he does mortgage, right? So as mortgage, right, you need to make sure that you keep abreast with everything that's happening in the economy with the interest rate and everything. That's how he's able to give advice to his clients accordingly. What is the best course of action to take right now, right? So for myself, I also engage him for my own mortgage uh, 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 refinancing and all this, and he has helped me a lot, right? But that is another, another topic later on. But before that, I want to invite Ethan to come up here to really share with us what is the overall view of the economy and what are the key statistics that we should be paying attention to so that all right, we are able to make better informed decisions. All right? So if you, are, if you guys are excited to learn from Ethan, can you type E in the chat? Okay, E stands for Ethan. All right. So thank you so much, Ethan, for taking up your time to be here. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thank you for bringing me back. You are oh, amazing. Everybody. And that's why I always need to keep you coming back so that we can all learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. I try. I try. At the end of the day, the information I pass to you guys, I know you guys will be able to make full use out of it. So uh, I think uh yeah let's get started yeah so oh, I'm gonna... you want to share screen okay i am sharing right now okay there we go okay so ladies and gents um so right now fomc was just over last week and then um mr jerome power dropped a hell of a lot of news and i'm going to dissect all of them for you today Okay, so a little bit about myself first. Uh, I am the economist of Unbeatable Mortgage. We specialize in bank loans in Singapore. We have a proven framework and um, we work with all the banks. So uh, what we do, right? Um, first things first, I need to be able to disclaim because this, uh, this is a session where we talk about a lot of forward-looking statements and uh, we are not fortune tellers. Lah. We are data analysts. We look at the data and we try to make the best prediction for you guys okay so this is important because singapore don't control you interest rates and us is where we actually take cue from for the whole of singapore the sora rates at least okay so this is the banger that mr jerome powell just dropped and jerome powell i want you guys to look at this whole thing as the whole economy and how um this is going to affect your investment thesis and everything we'll look into the federal funds rate later but first let's look at the macros first things first uh change in real gdp at this point of time to, from the march projection to today right there is not much of a change as you can see it was 2.1 and then now it's 2.1 so at this point of time they are holding this consistent all right, and they, they do not see any form of um, they do not expect any form of economic recession. They are believing that the economy is doing quite well, and this is these numbers are actually supported because inflation, the the unemployment rate, they are aiming for four percent, which is the same as the March projection. Okay, and then the, for the PCE inflation this is where things start to get a bit more exciting because Jerome Powell and his whole team, right, they only got two jobs. Step, uh, job number one is to keep inflation down. Job number two is to make sure that unemployment is not too crazy. So at this point of time, the, the parameters that they set is about four, which is okay at this point. PCE inflation, they, are expecting, they were expecting 2.4, but right now they are taking a more conservative stance at 2.6. And are you able to share with us what is PCE? 
PCE is personal consumption expenditure. So this is what they actually look at. Later, I got the more in-depth hmm. one. So let's, uh, I, I want to go through the whole thing. Uh, and then later, I go through the PCE. So um, right now, the core PCE, this is excluding the foods and uh, this is excluding the foods and volatile energy. They are expecting 2.8 instead of 2.6. Okay. So the, the story is, um, the economy is doing okay. Inflation is still prevalent, but unemployment rate is holding steady. So they do not want to risk stagflation. They actually decided to slowly, slowly um, release the interest rates. Previously, right, they expect this year to end at 4.6. But now they say this year should end around 5.1, which means last, last projection, they say that there will be three rate cuts. Mm. But this projection, they say only one. And not just that, right? The future numbers, right? Look at this. From 3.9 to 4.1. And this means that they are going to take their time and then slowly, slowly release to make sure that we do not go into a stagflationary market. Mm. So, and another more interesting thing, right, is the long-term number change. They initially decide to hold federal funds rate at 2.6 to keep inflation consistent at 2%. Now they are expecting 2.8. So right now there is a lot of information. Uh, this is a lot of information, but basically, if I were to summarize, the economy is doing quite okay for them to keep rates high still. Mm -hmm. If they were to cut rates too fast, inflation creeps back up they have to put the federal funds rate for higher and more people will suffer. So this is a more conservative approach by Jerome Powell and his team. Right? And I think for this, this is very interesting because um, this also leads us to the, the dot plot. So the dot plot, right, is, um, is a place where Jerome Powell and his team will be able to say, hey, how much, uh, what they think is the appropriate target range See, in March, they thought that this was the number. In March, they thought that mm. 4.63 to 4.78, which had nine votes by the participant. June, right? Uh, this is going to be interesting for 2024. This is only if you were to dive deep enough into the data. And uh, I hope I can do that and make things entertaining for you guys. So <laughs> over here, you can see that their vote is actually split. Eight of them say that there should be one red card at the end of this year. Seven mm -hmm. of them say don't have. Mm -hmm. So this is where we start to get more, more information. And I think um, this helps us with our projections. But like what uh, Chloe say, we don't only look at one data point. We look at many. First things first, headline inflation. This guy really don't want to go below three. It went to three. Mm -hmm. Then after that, it shot back up. Then it went down to 3.2, 3.1, then shot back up. And so on, so forth. It never broke three. And when we are looking at this, okay, this is when we were talking about PCE. So PCE is uh, the personal consumption expenditure with food and energy. Mm. At this point of time, with food and energy, it is at 2.7. And you can see that this is actually going, this is up and down lah, because at this point of time, the world is not very stable right now. But when you're looking at PCE excluding food and energy, because these are very, very volatile numbers, especially with all the things going on in this world, you can see that the, it is slowly coming down. And now it's it come down from 2.9 to 2.8, and Jerome Power in the question and answer, this one, I, I don't expect many people to uh, go and listen. Uh, but Jerome Power did say they are looking for about 2.7, 2.6 for the PCE, excluding food and energy. So this may be one of the few factors they may consider before lowering or not lowering the rates throughout the rest of the year. So, and next thing. At this point of time, the yield curve is still inverted. Chloe, do you have anything to chime in about the yield curve? 
I mean, usually during historical pattern is during UK inversion, ah. uh, generally the market will start to drop. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So the thing is, it is one it is one of the one of the uh, lazy man way of predicting um economic crashes. Because mm. when the, the thing invert usually in six to eighteen months, they will see an ex uh, they will see the market crash. But at this point of time, this fella running marathon from July 5th, 2022 until today, almost two years anniversary already. Okay. We have been in the inversion. So this is one of the few factors you must look out for. Unemployment and GDP growth was the two main things that I feel we should also look at be before making our judgments in terms of investment. Lah. So, um, Chloe, I would like to ask you, at this very interesting point of the economy, at this high interest rate and tip-top S&P 500 <laughs> environment, what should we do? Okay, so uh, it's a very good question, which I'm going to come into that section very soon. But before that, maybe we just summarize up what are the, some of the key points that Ethan just mentioned. Ethan, if you're able to share your slides again. So basically okay. what Ethan is saying that uh, the, uh, the, Fed, the, the Fed is not likely to drop rates so fast because the inflation still persists. And at the same time, the rate of the, the, the inflation doesn't seem to be slowing down, especially when they include food and energy, The it's still kind of itching, it, itching up, right? It's still yeah. like going up. Uh, right. However, if you exclude food and energy, which is slightly more predictable, then finally we start to see some change mm. of uh, going uh, downwards, right? Mm. So what the Fed wants is they want to at least see 2.6, right? 2.6. 2.6, 2.7 in the yeah. PCE, excluding food and energy. Yeah, before they will start to say, oh, okay, maybe right now it's really for us to consider to cut rates. So before that, uh, right now the rates are still going to hold until quite steady. Or uh, uh, they are not going to increase rate again, right? They're just going to hold it like like five point five right now. At this point, it depends. The thing is, at this point of time, Chloe, if inflation were to shoot back up, let's just say from 2.9 to 2.8, and then now you see 3.2, what do you think the Fed's going to oh, do? Oh, yeah, that's true. Then it will right. start to increase. Yeah. Correct. So, so everything is a bit more dynamic, like how you do your uh, thesis. Mm. Everything is almost connected. And then if enough checkboxes go in, and then your thesis is where we're going to run, uh, but once again, we're not fortune tellers. We are data mm. analysts. Mm. So, <laughs> so, so as you can see, like even, uh, like even the Fed themselves also don't, have a clear answer. That's how mm -hmm. their projection also changes from March until now, June, they change. Maybe in September, they might they might change again. So right. that's why the economy situation is very versatile, very volatile. And that's why as an investor, we should learn to be more, um, I think, vigilant and at the same mm. time, learn to be prepared regardless what happened. <laughs> or maybe the UK inversion finally come, uh, like UK inversion is already here and, and finally maybe the stock market start to drop again. Then you know you are prepared, you know? Uh, right. so, so, okay, very good. Thank you so much, Ethan. How many of you learned a lot from Ethan's uh, quick and economic sharing? Uh, he, can, he can go very deep, but I think he also doesn't want to bore you guys with a lot of detail. He just want to share with you the most important information. If you felt you learned a lot, can you type learn in the chat, okay? So now let's integrate whatever things that Ethan shared into the current stock market situation, which I'm going to share with you what is my take right now, all right? Based on all the statistics that Ethan has shared with you guys. Thank you so much, Ethan. I'm going to overtake your share screen. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Now, okay, so I'm very, very happy that a lot of you guys have learned a lot from Ethan also. And later on, Ethan will share even more amazing uh, things to help you guys further. So uh, exactly what's the question? The question is, then what should we do now in this all-time high situation? At the same time, the, the inflation seems very still persistent. Uh, and the economy actually still seems to be very, very stable, right? Employment rate mm. is, is still very low at 4% and all this. Mm. So what should we do? So now the thing is, we have seen that the market is all time high. And we also have seen that the valuation is actually pretty overvalued. So shall we be selling right now? If you actually look at Buffett, right? 
he always say this, right? It's it will be a fool trying to time the market. Because just like what you have seen from the Federal Reserve reaction, they can also never predict the market. And that's why their projection does change over time. So if you constantly just trying to time time the market based on, oh, right now the market seems high, the market seems low, and you will end up actually making wrong guesses and making silly mistakes. How many of you can agree with what Warren Buffett say? If you agree, can you type A in the chat, right? So that is why, right, instead of trying to speculate and think, oh, I think 36 times P ratio is too high. I think I should sell off everything and exit from the market and see how it goes. When will it drop? You never know. <laughs> Maybe this can persist for another two years Then you miss two years of bear, a bull market profits, right? So don't try to tie in the market. Instead, we use Buffett as a reference point so that we can see how can we better invest. And if you can see Buffett's investment portfolio, despite the market being high, he is not keeping it all as cash, right? In fact, you can see that majority of his holdings is still in the equity securities, which is the stocks, right? Investing in good companies and all this. So that is 63%. And he has cash, which is about 34%. And then this one, uh, fixed majority security, a little bit fixed in terms of uh, the return. That is very little, bonds and all this. So we want to majority look at how much is he investing in the stock market and how much is he keeping as cash. So as you can see, his rule right now is about 65 to 35. So which is what I would suggest, right? During this period of time, right? Some of my students, I, I've been coaching them uh, in my ETF community. Some of them told me that they are 100% invested. Then if this is you, okay, I'm not sure whether, whether are you 100% invested. If this is you, you should really, really, really think about where can you take profits or where can you trim down some of your positions? Because if you can see that Buffett, he is not 100% invested. I don't think he will ever be because he always needs to keep certain cash, right? However, right now you can also see that he is not extremely bullish regarding every single position. And that's why he wants to make sure he hold enough cash to wait for opportunities, right? So ask yourself right now, right? What is your percentage? And can you shift your percentage allocation according to the wisest, right? The what most respected investor on earth, and that is none other than Warren Buffett, right? So 65% invested versus 35% cash. Okay, can everybody type 65, 35 in the chat, right? So that you can remember this ratio, which is Warren Buffett's current portfolio right now, right? Very, very close, right? So now if you are very far off from 65 and six, uh, and 35% cash, then ask yourself, then firstly, you need to find out what is your composition, right? If you are somebody who don't even keep track, um, it's a little bit dangerous because you don't even know how are you allocating your assets, right? You want to have clarity. So you need to go and start to calculate for yourself. And then at the same time, once you're done with the calculation, ask yourself, then are you under investing? Or are you over-investing? Like for example, if you are 100% invested, that means you are over-invested. If you are only 20% invested, that means you are under. So you want to adjust accordingly. And with that, then you can ask yourself the next question is, what should you trim or what should you add? How many of you understand this uh, thought process? If you understand, can you type HW in the chat? HW stands for homework, right? <laughs> that is for you to do your own investment research homework, right? And they, I think this is the first very important step, right? So for someone who's starting to invest, oh, how to start investing? Okay, very good. So Vinda, right? If you are completely new to investing, can you start to buy a little bit, buy a little bit, right? I'm not asking you to go 100, uh, firstly, it's, it's never 100% because it should be about 65%. But I also do not expect you to immediately invest 65% into the market. Can you stagger out that 65% in the next six months or the next 12 months? Depends on how comfortable you are with the pace. If you don't mind to be slightly more aggressive, you can try to you know, invest your 65% 
in the next six months, still stagger out, still dollar cost averaging into the market, all right? buying good companies, buying good ETF. However, if you want to be spreading your eggs even further, you can stagger until 12 months. It really depends on you, right? So can everybody type six to 12 months, right? So this is a general rule of thumb. There's no hard and fast rule. Different investors are different. If you are very risk averse, then six to 12 months will be good. If you are somebody more willing to take on more risk, well, you can maybe consider invest your 65% in the next three to four months. It's also possible. So there's no hard and fast rule answer. You need to be aware of yourself, right? So for myself right now, okay, I just want to give you a quick update of my own portfolio, right? So as you know, right, I am now really just scaling back a lot of the individual stocks to ETF because I really think that this is the most no-brainer way of investing. I don't need to monitor the market. I can be traveling traveling at the same time and I don't need to stare at like worry about, oh, what's going to happen to the stock market? What's going to happen to, to the individual stocks? Because I really want to remove all those worries. And that's why you can see that right now, actually I am about 60% into ETF and then 10% into individual stocks. And at the same time, I still keep cash, right? And I kind of follow quite closely to what Buffett is already doing. So he has about 35% cash. I have about 30% cash. And I think it's, I'm pretty okay with that, right? So uh, in these few months, unless the market gives me a lot of opportunities, I won't be aggressively buying. But at the same time, I'm not aggressively selling as well because at the end of the day, I don't want to get off the market as long as the market is still intact, as you can see, Ethan has already shared, right, that, you know, the unemployment rate is low, uh, the inflation rate, even though it's still slowly going up, but it's kind of like pretty stable. So currently, it still looks okay. And Buffer is keeping 65% invested. I'm just going to stay put as it is, right? So uh, that's why it's so important that when you invest right you will we want to build a portfolio can everybody type p p stands for portfolio right and some of you say jasmine bond right is it possible to talk, talk about uh, uh to do bonds as well you can right so bonds it's actually in buffett's view it's like those fixed return investment and he only has about three percent so for yourself when you do bonds you might not want to do a lot because at the end of the day it's not going to give you uh, very, very decent return in the long run, right? So if you're buying short-term bonds, give you certain uh, good interest rate, like for example, 5% or I don't know, 6%, 7%, I think it's still okay, right? But in the long run, uh, bonds might not be the most uh, suitable vehicle. That is also from Buffett's opinions as well. You can go and read out more about it, right? But nevertheless, you can consider including some of the portfolio inside bonds. But I think majority, you should be at first looking at, of course, right? Either look into ETF, which I I have been really, really like advocating this, right? And then at the same time, you can also look into great companies, right? They are all, you can't go wrong with great businesses, just that you do need to analyze them and, and keep up with all of the happenings of, of those companies. And of course, keeping cash is an option. Now, this is not the only things inside my portfolio. I have other things as well, right? If you still remember previously, I actually shared this in my Telegram channel that I have all these different categories. So some of you can see I have a little bit of bonds, right? Which uh, with CPF, so as I categorize them in with, my, with a little bit, it's not a lot of money. Uh, it's about 50K. Yeah, so not a lot. Yeah. So at the same time, I also have crypto, right? A little bit as well. This one also not a lot of money. It's about 50K or so, right? So I just diversify a little bit, a little bit. Then of course, uh, whatever things I share with you, the cash and at the same time, uh, giving me pretty good, decent return is using money market funds. So that's why I put my money with iFast, right? Giving me decent money market funds return. Um, and, and then actually the major bulk, right? Major bulk is still going back to stocks as well as my cash. And last but not least is my property, right? Because when you have a property, when you buy a property in Singapore, generally you requires quite a lot of uh, cash up front. And even though it does seems a little bit hard to enter because the cash amount is quite a lot. However, I felt that it's a very safe way to safeguard your cash because when you are investing in a Singapore um, property market, it's generally very stable. It just 
interest upwards over time, just like the US stock market, it just generally goes up over time, right? It's a very safe way of uh, diversifying your assets. So for myself, back then, when I first bought this, uh, this condo, it's a million dollar. I still remember it's like just nice, slightly under a million. So when you put in the down payment, everything after that, you still need to refinance the mortgage, right? And I clearly remember at that time, I bought it during COVID time, right? So COVID time, uh, that was the best time because the interest rate was so low, right? Everybody is cutting interest rate to encourage businesses to go and do business, uh, encourage people to go and borrow money. Right? So I think I got it at a very, very good time when the interest rate was super low. But then the moment I collected my key, which is actually, wow, almost close to, was it about two years ago? or one, at least one and a half years ago, right? Oh, I think one, one year plus, yeah, one year plus ago, one year plus ago. And then by the time, the interest rate has already gone up so much because uh, the Fed realized that the inflation is going crazy, right? So because of that, <laughs> the interest rate also goes crazy. And at that time, I couldn't even fix my interest rate. So it was floating at about 4.59% was crazy. So my monthly mortgage, I just... I just look at it like $1,000 just for my monthly mortgage. And now I want to put things into perspective. As much as we know property can give you cash flow, right? If you rent it out. And I indeed rent it out. But my rental was only 3008 So guys, if you take a look, uh, 3008 is my monthly rental. I need to pay a $4,000 mortgage. On top of that, I need to pay my maintenance fee. I need to pay my property tax. In the end, my net net, I'm basically negative, right? I'm in fact forking out cash every single month just to maintain my property. And on top of that, the property I'm not staying, I'm not enjoying, I'm getting other people to rent it, right? So it's, how many of you can feel it's quite painful uh, if you are in this situation? You can, you can feel the pain, uh, can you type P in the chat? And P stands for pain, okay? So I was bleeding. And that was when, okay, I talked to Ethan. I said, Ethan, oh, very painful. Every month, <laughs> even though I have a property right now, but I feel very painful. I don't want to have my cash flow coming, going out every single month. What can you do for me? Right? So Ethan being a very good friend and because he's very experienced in the mortgage sector and he quickly helped me to refinance everything and plan out according to what is suitable for me at that time based on the best market rate. So because of him, uh, can you see I reduce my installment, my monthly mortgage installment. At first was 4K, right? And now I only need to pay 2.3K. So guys, if we add everything, right? 2.3K I need to pay. Now let's go back to the same same rental story because basically I rent to the same person. That person still pay me $3,800. But right now, my mortgage is only $2,300. And plus all the maintenance fee and property tax, which I still have to pay, net, net right now, what is my cash flow? Net, net, am I positive or am I negative, guys? Right, right now, what do you think? Do a simple math. Right now, I am positive. And in fact, I'm not just positive $100 or $200. I'm positive $900. And I'm really, really impressed and in fact, very grateful to Ethan. Because of that, my net cash flow position changed from negative, uh, at first remember, it was negative 700. And right now become positive 900. So my net net cash position, because Ethan helped me to refinance and everything, right? I'm Basically, a net change of $1,650. Guys, who don't mind uh, actually having more additional cash flow like this for your own property if you already have one, right? Every single month. If you want it, if this sounds something that can help you to increase your savings, can you type S in the chat, right? This is savings. Uh, to me, whatever amount that you can save is whatever dollars that you can invest in the stock market. Right? You can buy ETF, you can buy great company, you can do dollar cost averaging. Right, $1,650 is more than enough for many people to dollar cost averaging every single month. 
right? So that's why it's very, very important that if you have a property right now, right? Think about how can you refinance it or, or, or plan it properly so that you can actually have more savings and more cash flow. Right. And the beautiful thing about property, eventually, right, after you tie up, tie through that period of uh, you know, like finding a tenant and all this, eventually when when the property appreciates, which it does appreciate over time in Singapore, right? So for example, if you still remember my my condo basically is in Normanton Park, right? I bought it at one mil. Right now, based on the market price, people are selling like 1.2, uh, 1.15, and all this. So there's also capital appreciation, right? Uh, however, I can't say for sure right now because I haven't sold my house. But just looking at the cash flow side, I'm already very happy because every month I actually collect pocket money from my property. And at the same time, having a very good tenant to help me to take care of the entire property and having Ethan to really help me to increase more cash flow and savings. Uh. So I want to ask, over here, how many of you actually have a property like me? If you have, can you type P in the chat, right? And you are also thinking about, eh, is it possible to actually unlock more cash flow and have more savings to reinvest into the stock market? Okay. I, uh, yes, very good. Ethan, teach us how to refinance. Okay, so it, uh, Ethan is asking this question. Ethan asking, asking Ethan. Okay, so without further ado, okay, I also want to pass the time back to Ethan again. And Ethan, can you share with us exactly what can we do right now, right? For those who are in the similar difficult situation as me before, what can they do to refinance better? First things first, uh, um, when you talk about Singapore property, I think, this is one of the underlying assets that we need to think about. All right. Singapore is a very small country, 726 kilometers square, which means the supply is limited because the land is scarce. And then I ask you, when's the last time Singapore got a natural disaster? And then no. if a pandemic, where you want to be? And also, this is the best business environment 15 years in a row, best airport and a lot of things going for it. So the, the fundamental is good. So I think that the property will appreciate. But uh, once again, this is on a long-term view. La. Singapore is a really nice place. And if you are renting, it is a lot more expensive than you're paying mortgage sometimes. And Chloe, when you're paying for your mortgage, right, not 100% of it goes into um, interest payment. As you know, right, there is the, there is the principal component, component where it also goes down to pay down your mortgage. Yeah. So you bought at one mil. Yeah. Your mortgage 750. Now your mortgage is less than 750 already. Yeah. So, so yeah, you take 1.2 minus the almost 750 and then you will see quite a decent result. Lah. Right? So the next thing is, um, we want I want to share with you a little bit about mortgage. Uh, give me a moment. Let me share my screen. Yeah, so uh, uh, Ethan also asking me, the other Ethan, okay, asking me, how much should I put down for down payment? So in Singapore, it's about 20, if I'm not right, at that time it was about 26%. Then you still need to plus certain fees and all this. So I consider net net about 30%. So you treat mm. it as about 30% you need to pay for down pay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you need to pay uh, 5% cash, 20% CPF, and the rest can be loaned. So uh, if you are able to see, right, uh, let me give you guys a quick introduction about mortgage, okay? It's a home loan, you can borrow up to 70%. And then you're able to choose fixed or floating rate. Uh, and then uh, this is very important because if you choose the salar rate, right, you pay a lot more. <laughs> and then your monthly installment will go into principal and interest. So as you pay your mortgage over time, right, you can see uh, your outstanding loan will lower over time. And eventually, after you pay, finish everything, you got no more loan and a million dollar property under your name. So this is the most boring way to become a millionaire. All right. So that being said, right, I want to talk to you guys about on the ground, what's going on. The floating rates, not much change. The fixed rates may begin to increase. As I've mentioned earlier, right, the, the economy is actually going to start uh, slowing down uh, on the rate of cut. Jerome Power actually says, reduce from three to one. And on top of that, right, in the future, they intend to reduce slower to make sure everything is okay. So if I'm the economist for the bank, I will tell them to raise rates. Lah. But uh, thank goodness I'm here working with you guys. So, so when you're looking at fixed rates, right, they have interest rates as low as 2.85%. And then there is the one-year free conversion. 
All right. So one year later, the lock in is still two years, but one year later, you can change to a lower interest rate when the rates start cutting. All right. So first things first, I'm going to talk to you about the floating rate. Floating rate 300K, 4.23. 500k 4.18 and 800k 4.08 so it's quite high at this point of time As, and this is the one month sora and guys if you have no choice but to take floating rate aka you're in a building under construction a little bit similar to chloe's situation yeah. back then because when you buy a building under construction the mm -hmm. timeline is very long so they can only offer you floating rates so if you need to take floating rates, right? All right. And then you know that the environment is going down. Interest rates are going down. Everybody, should you take the three months floating rate or should you take the one month floating rate? If you think that the three months is better because got more stability, write three months. If you think the one month is better, then write one month. Everybody, okay. So while waiting for that to happen, I'm going to talk to you guys about the fixed rate later we'll come back to this okay so the fixed rate at this point in time quite attractive as compared to their floating rate for floating rate four plus percent 4.23 and 4.18 4.08 if you're looking at 800k and above but when you're looking at floating rates 300k you can already get 2.9 percent and why am i recommending floating rate fixed rates or Okay, this is not a recommendation, by the way, uh, public domain. <laughs> so why I'm thinking that the fixed rate may be better is because interest rates are going to come down a little bit slower. Okay, so where interest rates are going to go, monetary policy tells us that the exchange rates are the, the thing, the tool that we use to offload inflation. And domestic interest rates have been typically below the US interest rate and reflect market expectations of a trend of appreciation of Singapore dollar over time. A lot of times when I tell people trend of appreciation, a lot of people don't quite see it. But let me tell you, when you're looking at Singapore dollar against most major currencies, you'll be able to see quite the happy chart. So everyone who wants to go overseas and spend, have fun. <laughs> so next thing is the Singapore savings bond. Okay, remember our mortgage only 2.9%. And Chloe, remember you were telling me you got quite a lot of cash position, right? Yeah. You can consider putting into Singapore savings bond. Their risk-free rate is 3.3%. You want to take out the money, right? You'll be able to take out with $2. Then after that, they will pay you um, your, um, your interim amount. Yeah. So, so, so they, will, they will pay you according to when you take out. And... Uh, I think this is one of the best tools to park your like fast money, which is what you said earlier in the slide. Mm. Uh, some of my clients take out money to put inside here. <laughs> so they are charged. But anyways, um, let's look into data. So guys, over the past performances are not indicative of future results. However, 94.47% <laughs> is 94.47%. Yeah. So what we can see, the Sora line is the one that is red in color. And then the effective federal funds rate is the brown in color. All right. So what happens every single quarter, right? Me and Chloe will chit chat and then I will come and draw my Picasso. <laughs> this is where I come and I mean, Picasso got his stuff. This is mine. La. This is my, my piece of art. La. So guys, let me walk you guys through. So... Once again, these are in squiggly lines be intentionally because we don't know what's going to happen. So as we can see, currently it's 5.33, Sora's about 3.65. And then in 2024, end of 2024, they are expecting the effective federal funds rate to drop to 5.1. And in turn, the corresponding number we see for Sora uh, is about 3.49. So it will plus minus 10% from there. This is according to the effective federal funds rate where they are going to go la, because ultimately we take Q from there. Then 2025, we are going to see it go down to 4.1. So 2025 is a very interesting point because you see 
2025 is going to be one and a half year from today. Mm. So if you want to be able to make a decision whether to take fixed rate or floating rate, you should take something a bit far out and try to project conservatively. So if you're looking at 2025, end of 2025, one and a half year from today, you'll be able to see that Sora is likely to be around 2.81 there about. If you plus 0 0.4, you're actually looking at about 3.2, which is still higher than if you were to take the fixed rate. Once again, this is not a recommendation. Do feel free to call me if you want to have some highly personalized um, recommendation because everybody is different. The way I advise Warren Buffett and the way I advise Chloe and the way I advise you may be completely different because different stages in life. So last thing is um, I love renting money because money depreciates. There is a inflation. So if you're borrowing below inflation, I think that is not bad. And because of because you guys uh, listen to me, Jabba, I want to be able to give you guys a little bit of value. I want to be able to tell you guys exactly what to do for your mortgage every step of the way so that you're able to save the most money. This is for building under construction. If you intend to buy a property that has not been completed yet, you can screenshot this and this is the best route forward. Once again, guideline, you'll be able to tweak accordingly depending on what you want to do. Uh, and this is for resale. Okay. Before we look into all of this, this is a general guideline and uh, in Unbeatable Mortgage, we have our, our um, framework to make sure that we uh, squeeze uh, blood from rock, make sure you save as much as money as possible. We have strategy, which is what you're intending to do. We have structure and sequence, which is how you're going to buy. And then we have rates, which is all of today, we are talking about where interest rates are going to go. We work with 10 banks. We are able to get you the best ones. Uh, gotta love perfect competition, yeah. So, <laughs> so I think there are certain qu certain questions from Ethan as well. Sora is fixed rate in Singapore or floating rate? Sora is the Singapore overnight rate average. The person who named it really got no originality. But Sora is the floating rate that everybody looks at in Singapore because that is the most transparent rate. I ask you. Which rate do you trust? One that is regulated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore or a floating rate given by the bank based on their fixed deposit where they can change anytime. Mm. Mm. And the thing is, when you're looking at those kind of um, bank rates, right? sometimes uh, got good, got bad. Lah, right? So for example, right, when you're looking at bank rates, right, they are looking at the, uh, they take the $1,000 to $10,000 fixed deposit rates which are typically one of the worst lah. Mm. so um, there's a lot of factors involved and uh, Sora is the floating rate and then usually they will add one spread this spread um, just now right was about 0 0.2 0 0.4, right? 0 .4. 0 .4. all right so yeah. over here the current Sora rates right are about um, 3.748 okay then uh, 3.65 there about lah then uh, it will be able to add the spread of 0 0.5, 0 0.55, or 0 0.4, depending on the loan size. And then you get the number, and that is the interest rate you're paying. So if you're going for the three months rates right now, you're looking at the three months aura plus a spread of 0.55%. If 300k, 500k plus 0.5, 800k plus 0.4, lah, then um, that is the rate you'll be getting. Mm, I see. Mm. So, so based on the question that you talk about just now, you asked a question about one month or three months. Okay. So what? Yeah. So what is thank the you. answer? Thank you for thank you for saying that. Thank you for bringing me back. Appreciate you, Chloe. So, let's say three months, right? Three months. Yes, you get more stability. But you see, right? Three months, you're looking at a ninety day average. So yeah. if your front date, if your two days rate starts to drop it will be one divided by 90 kind of impact. Whereas if you're looking at the one month, right, and today's rate start to drop, the impact is one divided by 30. Make sense? So the average of 30 days, it will go down faster than the average of 90 days in a declining market. Does that make sense? Mm. 
Mm. So because of that, if you have no choice but to take the floating rates, or when it is time to change to floating rates, I think the play may be for us to go for the one month Sora rates to be able to see the decline faster and to be able to save as much money as humanly possible and get rich together. Lah. I see. Okay. Mm. So, so predicting that the interest rate will lower in the coming years, so should we choose floating instead of fixed instead? So, great question. So, I ask you, Chloe, at mm. this point of time, let's just say like, we, we, use a, we use a rough number so that we'll be able to decide. Okay? So, we say 700k loan. Okay, yeah. 700k loan, you're looking at 2.88%, mm. right? And then you're looking at the one month Sora, let's just say. One month Sora of plus 0 0.5, okay? Okay. So we, one month Sora plus 0 0.5, so we bring over to our projections once again. And then we see 2025, what do we expect our interest rates to be? We expect effective federal funds rate to be 4.1 and we expect SORA to be 2.81. Mm. So if we are looking at this, right, 2.81 plus 0 0.5 is 3.31 3. 3. 1. 1. Yeah. versus 2.88. This is one and a half year out. Uh. Mm. So from now, until the one and a half year mark, right? If you're taking the 2.88, you're saving a lot of money. Yeah. Mm. Makes a lot of difference. Yes. And yeah. because of that, right? Um, This is just one out of the many things that we do for our clients to be able to make sure that they get the cheapest rates possible and then everything else uh, with the, with the um, strategy of what they intend to do plus the sequence and structure of what they choose to accomplish. Then from there, we advise accordingly. All right. Yeah. So for myself, I went for the fixed rate because right. um, because I think what, uh, at that time, Ethan also shared with me that although the Fed is likely to drop rates, that was like, you know, um, more than one year ago, they already mm. start to prompt that, oh, maybe we're going to drop rates. But you know, like one year down the road, they are still not dropping rates. And then based on the uh, situation that Ethan have shared uh, with you just, just now, like you can also see that the inflation still remains pretty high, right? Mm. And and the Fed right now is actually reducing the anticipated cut All right. frequency this year. So that's why uh like like it's kind of actually better if you can fix at a slightly decent uh attractive rate right now as compared mm. to hoping that the rate will drop, you know, because you just don't know how long will they actually start to cut. Yeah. Correct. And like I said, at this point in time, I do not know what the banks may do. Mm. But likely, if they were to increase rate, this is, if they want to increase rate, this is the best cue for the economists to actually look at, uh, considering to advise the bank to increase rates. Lah. And like, probably your rates, ah, the, the one that I get for you, right? The bank lose money, confirm, 100%. <laughs> confirm. Confirm 100%. It's even lower than Sora rates. Eh? You know, without the spread, it's crazy. And yours is one year log in only. So, yeah, yeah but uh, those kind of rates are not available now. It depends seasonally. At this point in time, there is the Maybank rates for above $1 million. You are able to get the one year free repricing, which allows you to get better rates. But there are a lot of other things out there. For example, if you intend to sell your property, then go and get the ones that give you waiver of fees upon sale. If you intend to optimize your cash flow, make sure you can extend your loan tenure. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of levers that we can pull together to be able to help you save as much money. Yeah. yeah. And by yeah. the way, guys, whatever rates, like for example, uh, Eden share with us certain banks and all this. Uh, if you go to the banks themselves, they mm. will not tell you. They will not share with you. Oh, we have these very good rates. Uh, no, actually, these are uh, by right actually off bracket right they are not yes. they cannot tell you cannot uh yeah. if i tell if i tell you guys i will possibly lose my partnership with the banks mm. yeah they're quite they're quite strict on this la. they say strictly no circulation which is why i cannot uh include which banks are offering what rates yep 
Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's why only when like when you go on the the consultation with Ethan, based on your current situation, the team and Ethan will be able to best analyze. Oh, mm-hmm. then these banks are actually giving you uh decent rates, then you can consider. Yeah, because they 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 cannot share openly like that. So based on different people, different situation, they will advise you accordingly and customize that for you. Yeah. All right. So I think Ethan, I think some of them are also getting curious. Then, then uh, how how much do you charge for consultation like this to help them to save, unlock cash flow, and all this? I'm charging absolutely zero at this point of time. This is my favorite thing to do. I don't charge you guys money. I help you guys save money. We all become rich together. So <laughs> this is why I love my business. This is why I started it. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> People might be wondering, oh, then how can you hop around banks and inquire and, oh, can you hop around banks and and and, and compare the rates? Okay, uh, for me, that is my yes. job. Yes. Uh, so 10, bank- yes. 10 bankers report to me and then they tell me what the rates are. Every one of them, they give me the best rate possible. The reason why is because they know that I am very pragmatic. They know that I don't care about their feelings. They know that I don't care about anything else other than saving my clients money. So all of them will give me their best rate. Otherwise, they don't get the case. And everybody wants to get case. So once again, we love perfect competition. And some people sometimes, you know, they, they give you deviated rates, rates that are not even listed. So sometimes, for example, uh, if your case is like... um. $970,000 loan, correct? Can you go for the 1 million number? Can you go for the 1 million dollar rates? Answer is most of the time, no. However, with me, usually I go and try to throw the banker a little bit, offer a little bit of prata, tell them, hey, come on la, this other bank giving this rate, can you? Yeah, so, I am a professional um uncle <laughs> so <laughs> i go around get new best rates and hopefully they are bad, lower than inflation then everybody has a good time yeah and yeah it's been good so far so irene is curious right now like how do you make money then since you don't charge any fees from your consultation <laughs> yeah how, how 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 can you make money irene fantastic question the banks they pay to the bankers that you go to a commission fee. They also pay the bankers basic. They do not pay me basic. They pay me a commission lesser than the bankers because, you know, I got no loyalty. Ma. I work with 10 banks. Um, and because of that, my cases come in a bit more, quite a lot more. I get a small cut from the bank, which is able to substantiate my living, be able to um, feed my family and make sure that you guys earn enough. That's why I don't have to charge money. I know that there are some there are some cases though that uh, we do charge because of um, very, very complicated cases. Um, but for you guys today, you all come over, you all click the sign up later. Even complicated cases we do for you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ethan, for being so kind. Okay. Hey, no Hopefully- problem. Hopefully, none of your case is complicated. We just keep it simple. That's the best. That's the most straightforward, easy to settle, right? However, if it's really complicated cases, you know, sometimes it's so funny. I, I remember I had lunch with Ethan once and then he said like, uh, hey, am I, am I, can I share this? Like the bankers actually ask you, hey, Ethan, very complicated. Can I go and settle it? <laughs> ah, God. Uh, but it's not the bankers that reach out to me. It's the property agents. Oh, the property agents that reach out to me saying, oh, um, the OTP already signed already, but the bank don't allow for the loan to be dispersed. Ethan, tomorrow, pang, pang, man, please. Ah, then this is where my specialty come in. I go, I don't just go to one bank because the one bank can approve you 500k. The second bank might approve you 550k. Everybody use different ruler to judge how strong your purchasing power is. And the thing is, the good thing is I have 10 rulers, uh, which means I, I can take the best measure. We can choose the best measurement and then go towards that. Um, and it is, it is one of the more important things because this actually helps clients 
who already put in money already. Uh. So these clients already put in money, like 5% down, the exercise already done already. Uh. Then they tell me, Ethan, if you don't get me this loan, I will lose the 5% of the property. Can be 50, can be more. Mm. And oftentimes this can be quite a scary number. Lah. So I do everything I can. And so far, uh, I've got most of my cases approved. All of them, in fact. Uh, but I will still say 99% approvals because I do not know what is going to happen. I wow. am... I, I also want to get you guys the loan, but I'm not the bank. <laughs> but I got 10 banks, so that's okay. Yeah, so, okay, so I think it, uh, people are also very curious. Uh, if they need your help or your team help, how can they uh, reach out to you? Uh, is there any form that they can actually fill out? Yes, there is. And Chloe, I think we have a form that's been going on for a while. Um, you share or share? You share, you share. I share. Okay, one second. <laughs> uh. Let me get the ring. Let me get the link. Okay. So, yeah. So, just like what uh, Ethan said, like, basically, he is very passionate about what he likes to do. Like, he likes to crunch number. He likes to analyze uh, like personal situation and how can you get the best deal from the bank and he doesn't charge at all for his services and then at the end of the day if the deals go through the banks like you get your own savings the best savings that he can get for you and the banks manage to approve your loans then that's how he get a little bit of commission from the banks himself right so so I think it's really good service from his end and at the same time really good savings from, from your ends also right so okay uh, yeah, uh, people are saying, thank you, Ethan. Perfect. How nice. Irene said that uh, banker make a lot of money. <laughs> okay. So in the meantime, uh, if you guys have ad additional questions, feel free to ask it right now so that uh, later on, Ethan, uh, he can also probably just answer a few more questions before we wrap it up. Um, so uh, can I ask what is 0 0.5 uh, for Sora that makes 3.31 Floating, why we choose plus 0 0.5 instead of uh, plus 1 thereafter. Yeah. Okay. okay, so so in the meantime, okay, for those who uh, want to get Ethan and his team to help you to link the situation, how can uh, you guys help, uh, how can they help you to refinance a property or any related question regarding loan, mortgage, you know, whatsoever. Uh, if you are not sure, you can actually click on the link right now inside the Zoom chat and Ethan uh, once you fill out the form based on the situation, he will be able to. Oh, uh, right now, hey, uh, Eden, you might need to unlock the form. Okay. Um, one second, ah, uh. let me just yes. do that. I will do that within the next three minutes. One moment. Um, my Google got too much. Power. Okay. Apologies. No problem. One second. All right. So in the meantime, uh, uh, free mortgage consultation form. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh. Zijian also mentioned that, that right now it's uh, closed, so he will unlock it for you guys. Sorry about that. Okay, hold on. Huh? Let me try another uh, uh, why is that unbeatable mortgage. Eh? Ethan, I think it's this link. Eh? Hold on. Yeah. Huh? Oh. oh, but that one also locked. Both are locked. Okay, uh, now I, oh, one second, uh, this one, one second, let me go over here. Uh, get offer, <laughs> apologies. Previously, we used this link. Mm -hmm. I just sent it in the chat, uh, rebrand.ly unbeatable mortgage. Previously, that was the form that we used. Correct. One moment, uh, subscribing to the Google Plus and Tada is done. One second. Let me go over here. Refresh. Get more. Huh? One second. Uh, give me a moment. Uh. It should be updated shortly. I've, I've gotten it already. I paid the money already. It should be coming in soon. <laughs> One moment. Uh. Too, too many inquiries until... Until you forgot to update Google. <laughs> uh, yeah, because the storage was full. One moment. Yeah. No problem. All right. In the meantime, yes, it works. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. So, Ethan said oh, that I it works. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ethan. Thank you so very much, Ethan. Thank you, guys. All right. So, okay. So, let me just send the link again. Okay. I just send it. Rebrand.ly slash unbeatable mortgage. Right? That is Ethan's company. So, let me just quickly share screen. Once you just click on the link, rebrand.ly unbeatable mortgage, you will come here. All right. So, uh, please make sure you enter your personal details so that Ethan and the team can contact you. And please let them know what are you uh, looking for. Are you applying new loan? Are you refinancing? Are you trying to reprice? And uh, do you have a preferred date of the call? Because they will need to call you to find out about your personal situation first and then so that they can uh, give you the best advice. And from there, they will devise a plan for you, right? So usually that will take about a few calls. Uh, the first call is to understand the situation. Then after that, they will, they will actually start to do the cal personal calculation for you, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, ideally put it so that they can call you based on your preferred time. Mm. And that's all they need. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Correct. So in the meantime, there are some additional questions that are uh, inside the chat. Um, Ethan, uh, uh, Ethan is asking, so can I ask what is plus five, zero, plus 0 0.5 Sora? Okay. It makes 3.31 floating. I understand. Let me go over to the slide before I start sharing. One moment. So, um, let me go and share screen. There we go. Okay. So, I want to be able to explain to you guys a typical loan structure before I go into that. Okay. Typical loan structure, right, is that they are looking, their first year, right, they give you nice rates. The second year, they also give you nice rates. Then thereafter, they give you horrible rates asking you to reprice or refinance. This is the same throughout every asset. Every amount usually is like this because the thereafter rates, this is where the banks make more money. Even when you're going for fixed rates, the thereafter rates, right? are usually three months or plus 1%, which is very, very expensive. So, if we're looking at the current rates today, right? Why we choose the we why we look at the year one and year two rather than the thereafter rates is because when we are applying that time, it will be a fresh new loans. It will be a fresh new loan that starts in year one. And your rates is good for two or maybe three years, depending on the bank. The thereafter is usually very bad. Um, I typically tell people not to get the thereafter rates unless they are looking to sell away their property. If they are looking to sell away their property and then they are still within their lock-in, the penalty can be 1.5% of their loan size, which can come up to tens of thousands of dollars. And sometimes the thereafter rates are worth it. Lah. But typically, you do not want to go into the thereafter rates. Going to thereafter rates is like paying for annual fee in the credit card. So <laughs> let's not do that. Okay, so I think that uh, should address Ethan's question. And mm. another question, uh, let's see. Okay, I think is there any more questions? Yeah, okay, so uh, answered for that. Any more questions before we wrap it up? All right. I think most importantly is uh, regarding uh, what, regardless what kind of questions that you might have, as long as it's related to mortgage, refinancing, and all this, um, mm -hmm. Personalized question best is actually asked during the consultation because right. they can understand your current situation, your uh financial commitment and all this, then they can help you to uh devise the best plan for you as well. Yeah. Okay. So uh any more things before uh even do you have any last very, very important advice or whatever things that you want to share before we wrap it up? All right. So um Using my service is free. But sometimes not using my service can cost you a lot more. So that's why uh, most people actually reach out. Like, I'll be able to help. Like, uh, and I think if you want if you want another set of eyes or another pair of um, uh, another brain working on your case and making sure that you can uh, save as much money as possible. There are, there are a lot of different uh, ways we can actually look at helping our clients. One is to help them optimize cash flow because cash flow is a lot of things. If your cash flow is negative, then that is the one thing that we want to try to fix. Mm. And the other thing is to 
reduce the loan for certain people. For certain people, they feel like, hey, uh, I got so much money. I don't want to pay mortgage. Ease of mind. And that is why our consultations are usually quite dynamic. It's a conversation where I uh, explore what are your needs, what, what you intend to do, whether you, got, you, whether you want to sell, whether you want to buy, whether you want to have two properties in the future, whether you want to have one HDB, then one condo. Ah, a lot of different strategies. So um, yeah, reach out. I'm yeah. here. We are here to help. And the reason why Eden, he is so familiar with it is because he has been in this industry for many, many years. In fact, he used to be working for a bank, right? All right. And that's how he know the intricacies of this industry from inside out, from within the industry first, then he jump out to, to become independent so that he can have uh, uh, more choices, what kind of banks that he wants to work with, what kind of more alternative that he can provide for his clients. And that's why it will be very, very, uh, I think, useful if you want to get a more independent view, dissect of your situation and how to make the best out of it. Yeah, so for myself, I'm really grateful to Ethan because he literally helped me to unlock $1,600 over dollars cash flow right? because of just one change, right? So so uh, if I did not get Eden to help, maybe right now I'm still either bleeding or like doesn't have as much a cash flow that I'm enjoying today. So thanks so much for, for, for being there for me when I need you. <laughs> no problem. I'm happy that I get to help. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So Eden, maybe we can... Uh, uh, you can unshare the, this and then we can just take a photo together and then we will wrap up for tonight. All right. Let me go and unshare this. Stop share. There we go. All right. So thank you so much, everybody. How many of you enjoyed learning from Eden and my uh, market update tonight? If you enjoy, you learn a lot, can you type me in the chat? All right. Love to see you guys uh, learn a lot and most importantly, take that right course of action to really unlock more savings and, and cash flow for yourself as well. All right. So in the meanwhile, I will be going to travel for one month and plan. Uh, I'm actually going to China for uh, on Wednesday. All right. So uh, that's why I want to do this special sharing tonight so that uh, Eden can help you guys within the next month even though I'm away and then I will definitely keep you guys updated about my trip and when I come back I will also do more updates like this as well right so thank you everybody thank you mm. everyone and Little, let's take a photo together all right oh, so, one last thing one last thing to add yes, sure. uh, it's not just me it's me and my team to, that will reach out to you guys so that we'll be able to help you dynamically like, there's quite a lot of response and that's why we got help from a couple of more um, seasoned investment investment um, investors, uh, you you had the pleasure of meeting him. <laughs> so yeah, 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 exactly. All right. So now let's take a photo and then let's wrap up for tonight. All right. Three, All two, right. one. Thumbs up. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a good good night ahead. And thanks so much, Eden, for taking care of my members here. All right. So I will see you when I'm back. See you. Thank Have you. a nice day. Enjoy your trip. Eh? Bye bye. Thank you. Enjoy your 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 July also. Thanks everyone. I will. I will. See you guys. Bye.